everybody. Welcome to the Redeeming Truth Podcast. My name is John Benzinger. I get to be one of the uh, pastors here at Redeemer Bible Church. And I'm with David Farnell, one of my seminary professors back in the day, and currently on staff here at Redeemer as the director of the uh, Redeemer Center for Church Leadership, a, a ministry we're hoping to get started here in the future, and something that one of the hallmarks that we want to really instill in the men that we're going to be training for ministry in the Redeemer Center is the issue of inerrancy. We want them to be rock solid defenders of biblical inerrancy, which brings us to the reason for our podcast today. Recently, there was an article that was proposed on the uh, Gospel Coalition website to update a document called the Chicago Statement for Biblical Inerrancy. And so some of the um, updates and some of the ideas need that, that are said to need an update, there's a staunch reaction to that saying that's completely unnecessary. And so I've, I've worked with Dr. Farnell here to, to begin to, to talk through some of these issues to help you understand what some of these issues are. To, the, the Gospel Coalition is a website that is for, um, for all Christians. It's not specifically scholarly, specifically for, for pastors. It's for everybody. And so because it's a website for everybody, we wanted to do something on our podcast, which is for everybody addressing this issue. And so Dr. Farnell, the issue of inerrancy. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave. I won't tell you what PhD stands for. I think I did that in the previous broadcast and got myself into trouble. But anyway, this is a very serious issue. It's being led by uh, evangelical critical scholars. We're going to have to explain that term, but I'd like to make this very practical for all of the churches out there that believe in the trustworthiness and truthfulness of God's word in its historicity. There's an old saying, those who do not learn the lessons from history will repeat them. Those who do not learn from the lessons of history will repeat them. And this is a very serious issue. I'm getting to be an old man now, and when I was in seminary, there were, was a movement of about 350 uh, seminary and college Bible professors that were alarmed at the breakdown in the trustworthiness of God's Word in Christian colleges. And I'll never forget, during my days at Talbot, during chapel, uh, the guys would fly out to Chicago, come back and report, and believe it or not, I still have the books they passed out in chapel about how they were fighting for the inerrancy of God's word against not liberal scholarship as much as evangelical scholarship that was beginning to use trickery to cast doubt on God's word. So it was called the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy. They came out with a statement on inerrancy. They came out with a statements on, um, uh, on hermeneutics. Uh, hermeneutics and then also on biblical application, and they disbanded. Most of those gentlemen now have gone to be with the Lord. If there are any of them alive, I, I am not sure on that, but... Well, the question is, why do they want to modify the statement when I think most, if not all, of the ICBI men that did it would say there's no need to modify it. They close shop. It's a historic document that left a witness to what they were experiencing in the late 70s, early 80s, about how the Bible was being attacked, not so much by liberals, but by those within the church. So the first thing we need to do is explain two terms so that people who are, believe the Bible can understand. There are liberal uh, critical scholars. These are the liberals who use radical methods to interpret the Bible. Everybody would be familiar with those, Boltman, Borncam, New Testament, Old Testament. Uh, other guys, Wellhausen, they used radical liberal methods to critically interpret the scripture and negate its history. 
But now we have a generation growing up since the ICBI statements called evangelical critical scholars. They like that term. Now, what are the evangelical critical scholars versus liberal critical scholars? Well, there is really no difference. They use the same methodology, ideology of historical criticism, which applies uh, different ideologies, source, form, redaction, literary criticism, narrative criticism, to do some fancy tricks with God's word to negate the historicity. They use criteria of authenticity, all sorts of things that if I explain to the audience what this is, they would probably be shocked that most, if not all, evangelical seminaries are now applying this to the scripture. So the only difference between a liberal critical scholar and evangelical is the degree of how much they negate or dehistoricize God's word. They all do it. It's a matter of the degree. So you say to me, Dave, what holds back evangelical critical scholars from going radical like the liberals? Well, I'll give you the answer to that. Only their personal integrity or for fear of loss of their job, do they not get as radical, but they get radical. And um, now they want to modify the Chicago Statement, which championed grammatico historical, which takes the rules of grammar and the facts of history. Please note that I said facts of history. The Bible says something, it is talking about what actually happened, and they want to do some fancy footwork with that. So let me give you a quiz, John, if you don't mind. Okay. I'm going to give John a quiz to see how good of an evangelical critical scholar he is and you are. So the first thing I want you to do, John, do you have a Bible on you? I do. Can you grab a Bible? I Sorry, I meant to say, and I forgot. I do. I have one right okay, here. Okay, Matthew 27. I want you to start at verse 45 when this is the story in Matthew of the crucifixion. And I want you to read it, and then I'm going to have just a true or false question for you. And everybody out there, open your Bibles, and I'll show you why they want to modify it by giving you this quiz. Matthew 27, 45 through 54. If you could just read it, and then we will uh, tell you um, how good of an evangelical critical scholar you are. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what had took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. Okay, let's talk about that. There was an earthquake during Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, tell me what other things that happened that the temple you just read. The curtain was torn in two. Okay. Uh, so Jesus was proclaimed as the Son of God. What else happened in that? Can you t tell me? Yeah, there were uh, bystanders who gave him sour wine to drink right oh, before he okay, died. Okay, so we'll cut to the chase then. <laughs> True or false? An actual resurrection of the saints occurred at Jesus' crucifixion, as indicated by Matthew. True or false? That would be true. That's false. You are a very poor evangelical critical scholar. We know from the work of Michael Lycona, who was educated uh, at a uh, place in South Africa, that that is not, never happened historically. It is something that is to be considered Jewish apocalyptic, and it never happened. There was no resurrection of the saints, and you missed the hermeneutical signal to show that. Come on, John, where's the hermeneutical signal? Show me where you missed that hermeneutical signal. I don't see a hermeneutical that signal. That is exactly correct. There was no hermeneutical signal. The reason why is now these guys want to modify the Chicago Statement to allow for saying that the Gospels are like Greco-Roman biographers or historians. Since the Roman and uh, Greek historians made up things, 
The Bible also makes up things, and they made up the story of the resurrection of the saints. It never happened. He does that in other portions, Michael Lycona, saying about the angels that they were probably not to be taken literally in all of this. So you're doing very poorly right mm. now, John, as an evangelical critical scholar. Here we go to the second one. You don't have to read this, but you know in Matthew 2, it talks about the visit of the Magi. So let's ask you a question. There was an actual visit of the Magi when Jesus was born as a child. Now he could have been up to two years old. I don't want to get into that, but the Magi actually visited, true or false? True. That is false. Again, you are showing yourself to be uh, unable to apply Greco-Roman biography. That's why they want to uh, modify the Chicago Statement because the Chicago Statement doesn't allow for this. They say that that is to be understood as what they call a uh, text with commentary. It's not historically true. It's a uh, uh, midrash. That's about right here and it gets real itchy. <laughs> it's Jewish midrash. Uh, these are all tricks that they use that they want to be able to say they agree with the ICBI, but we can dehistoricize and the Bible is still inerrant. There's a game afoot here, true or false. When you read Matthew 2, Herod killed the babies in Bethlehem, true or false? True, he had them killed. That's three strikes uh, on that. No, it not actually happened. A, a, a um, uh, killing of the babies in Bethlehem was made up by Matthew uh, as something to be understood figuratively. Robert Gundry, right after the first Chicago statement, uh, was uh, in uh, propounding that in his Matthew commentary. That never happened. That's why they want to modify the statement to allow for this to be in there. Let's try this one. True or false? Let's get simpler for you, okay? Okay. Paul wrote Ephesians. Read Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Okay. Love these computer programs, don't you? I had to walk a mile and write by a charcoal fire when I was in seminary, as they say. Go ahead. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. True or false? Paul wrote Ephesians. True. Strike four. He did not. A Pauline imitator. Donald Hagner says that's perfectly in line with inspiration of Scripture in his uh, New Testament uh, introduction. And there are many other evangelicals that Paul did not write that. A Pauline imitator did, but that's okay. It's still inspired and inerrant, even if whoever that was used Paul's name and falsely attributed it to him. Let's go, let's try this. Colossians 1.1. 1, 1. Can you read that for me? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. True or false? Paul wrote Colossians. True, he wrote Colossians. I tried to give you a hint. The answer is... That is false. That was someone who imitated Paul. Nonetheless, it's still inspired. We need to modify the statements of ICBI, which never would have allowed for this, in order to make it possible to say an imitator, not Paul. How about this one, true or false? Paul wrote the pastoral epistles. You want to grab 1 Timothy 1.1? 1, 1? Sure. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. Okay, who wrote that? Who said? Who did it write that? Uh, the Apostle Paul. Ah, sorry. Once again, you're zeroing on being an evangelical critical scholar. Uh, let's try this one. True or false? Jonah was a real person. It actually happened. Absolutely. That is false. You don't. You fail to understand the 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 genre signal. That is merely an allegory. So the Chicago statements would have never allowed in Article 13 and 18. They never allowed for dehistoricizing the Bible. But now they want to modify the even uh, the ICBI statements to allow for that and still say, I believe the Bible is inerrant, even though there are Pauline imitators and things didn't happen. How about this? True or false? God created the earth by speaking it into existence. True or false, John? Absolutely true. That is, uh, again, showing you're bankrupt. You are too Bible-believing. Walton and Sandy from Wheaton College wrote a book in which they used a uh, speech act theory. And in speech act theory, don't go asleep to, on me, everybody, just simply says this. The words of the Bible are not inerrant. It's the purpose of the words. So the purpose of Genesis 1 through 3 is that God created, but you can't use the words of Scripture to say how he did it. So they read evolution into Genesis chapter 1, and they still say, I believe in inerrancy. So that's why they want to modify the statement. They want to allow for you to say, it's all not really historical, but still inerrant. I mean, they could make the whole Bible an allegory, and they'd want it to say it was inerrant. Let's try another mm -hmm. one, trying to help you. Um, God created the world in six literal 24-hour days. True. Well, I'm sorry. 
The 11th question, no, those to, are to be understood in their genre as not being literal. We don't care if every time there's a limiting numerical adjective with the word day, it means 24 hours. I'm sorry, you didn't understand the genre. Finally, what the Gospels record of Jesus actually happened in the way it was recorded, true or false? Absolutely true. That is, again, false. You're not an evangelical critical scholar, which I can be very thankful for, to be honest with you. The Gospel <laughs> accounts of information that probably happened, but still that probably happened, but still might not have happened. True or false? They definitely happened. No. Uh, actually, uh, Bach of Dallas Seminary and Webb, who wrote key events, say that we have to apply criteria of authenticity, and in the Gospels, all we have are surviving traces of what Jesus did, and we have to apply that to figure out if it might have happened. There is no certainty in the Gospels. Do you understand that? There's no certainty. There's no certain. We need to modify Chicago ICBI to allow for this. Next, mm. the Gospels are actual historical accounts of Jesus' life. Of course, true. Adam and Eve were actual historical persons. True. No, I'm sorry. I, I I must score you as not being a critical evangelical scholar. I thank God for that. That's why you and I have started this. <laughs> I know of not one seminary that is not infected with this. So to make it simple, everybody. Uh, we could get into why they're calling for this, but since 2013, when the evangelicals had their conference at the, um, the Evangelical Society uh, of uh, ETS, Evangelical Theological Society, they have wanted to modify ICBI. Uh, Robert Yarborough calls guys like me, those are erring brothers on the right because he wants probably, is my guess, to allow for these things uh, so that the scripture uh, can be placed into a different area which would lead to its dehistoricizing of what most lay people in the pew would say happened. Now let me ask you this question just to think, and I'm gonna turn it back over to John. What do you think this is gonna do to the pastors in the pulpit, all these seminaries, Dallas Seminary. I graduated from there. I'll name them. I know I was in the New Testament department there. Uh, I had a professor where we had to read uh, the theology of St. Luke, and uh, Hans Konselman was a, uh, the guy that wrote it, and I actually identified his presuppositions that led him to do the very same thing as a liberal evangelical or a liberal critical scholar, and I was pulled into the office by a professor, you want me to mention his name? Sure. Daryl Bach, in which he said to me, I need to talk to you in my office. So he took me in there and I'll never forget. I felt like you ever been in an elementary school and you're sitting in those little chairs and the teacher is in a big chair. And he said, uh, I don't wanna hear where you disagree with liberal scholarship. They're the only ones doing good critical work. And if you don't start finding places you agree with them, you won't surmount the program at Dallas. So I knew when I was at Dallas that they had shifted and it's been, and that was right after ICBI, I knew that we were in trouble. So the simple reason that they wanna modify this is ICBI in inerrancy and hermeneutics would never have allowed for this. But if they can modify it, then they can say they believe in inerrancy even though things in the Bible can't be taken as they, uh, uh, or believed to have actually happened the way they did. That's it. So if you're watching this right now and you're wondering why in the world would we be talking about these things, the answer is very simple. Christian, you find yourself in the midst of a war right now, and the war is on many fronts, but when you boil the war down to its essence, the war is against the authority of God in this world. And the expression, the unique expression of God's authority in this world is the Bible. And so the attacks on the Bible are paramount and they are long lasting and they've been going for a very long time. And what has happened is there was a battle for the Bible. The, the lines were drawn, the battle was raging, the battle um, came to a head with the ICBI, the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy and the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy. From there, ETS, the Evangelical Theological Society, a couple years later adopted the ICBI as one of their documents. You had to affirm the ICBI in order to be a part of the Evangelical Theological Society. Well, from there, like Dr. Farnell said, the war is over. You know, the, the, the battle is, is done. 
But what has happened is that there are people within the ranks of evangelicals calling themselves evangelicals who change the definitions of the ICBI in order to fit their theology because they still, like, like, doc, like, like Dave said, want to keep their job, want to keep respectability within the guild of evangelicals, don't want to be seen as outside of that, but still adopt the methodologies, adopt the ideologies of non-Christians and apply them to the scriptures and then teach them as if they're legitimate. And they brag that they have the skill to do what no one in the history of the church has been able to do, take this ideology and use it for good. And, and you can tell by the fruit of what they're doing that they are not capable of doing this. Absolutely. And so when it comes to something like the proposal recently from the Gospel Coalition to change the, the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy, then you read the document, you read the proposal from Dr. Brown, and he chooses two very simple things in order to say, hey, we need to, we need to strengthen these things. We need to come alongside the internet, this this document, and strengthen it in light of current attacks on the Bible. However, when it comes to these documents, when it comes to a document like the like this statement on inerrancy, the question becomes: Why why not write a new one? If if this forty year old document is out of date, why not just write a new one? Now, let them now, now, exactly. Now, now, let now. them come up with their ideas. But let me show, share with you one other thing that I want to make sure that people who believe the Bible, they're now saying this uh, in a personal conversation with Daryl Bach, Bob Wilkin, had a conversation in which they now, these evangelical critical scholars view history in as we'll call it polarities. There's literal history over here where you believe Genesis, literally it happened. Then there's poetic fiction of the liberals where it didn't happen. It's nothing that we, we can make sense of. It's just a story that never happened. Their new position among evangelicals that they support in this writing is called poetic history. Now get that. Literal versus poetic, literal history versus poetic fiction. They take the Goldilocks middle and say, we think it should be called poetic history where Adam and Eve and the story of creation has somewhat of a mix of literal and figurative and it's up to the interpreter to figure out what we should take. And it's more leaning toward poetic language of what happened. This is where they're going. And so I guess, um, I guess, Dave, the question I would, I would want to start with, for people watching right now that are just kind of being introduced to this through what I'm saying and the test that you just gave me that I failed, thankfully, um, I guess the first question would be, what is inerrancy? Wear that F proudly. Uh, I will. Uh, well, I could give you other scholars. Uh, inerrancy is simply, the Bible says what it means and it means what it says. And even though it can use at times figurative language, the grammatico historical said you do not determine figurative language prior to your going into the text and examining the context. So what they do is they'll say they use genres or styles of literature and they'll say, well, the genre, the style here in Genesis, we can't take literally. So we're going to allegorize it. No, no, no. The Grammatico Historical and the ICBI guy said, you use the context and examine what the wording in the context says. And if there is no signaling of anything figurative, you don't take it in a spiritualized or non-historical sense. Look at D.A. Carson. For all of you who, I'm sorry, I'm the New Testament bad boy. They don't like me. Let me quote D.A. Carson on Genesis 1 through 3. There is more ambiguity in the interpretation of these chapters, that is Genesis 1 through 3, than some Christians recognize. I hold that the Genesis account is a mixed genre that feels like history and really does give us some historical particulars. At the same time, it is full of demonstrable symbolism, sorting out what is symbolic 
and what is not is very difficult. Now, can you imagine that? How many of you, you go to Genesis, you trust God, God doesn't lie, you go to Genesis 1 through 3, and the task of the evangelical critical scholar is to figure out what can I take literally and what can I take symbolically? And they will, depending on the scholar, and depending on their radicalness, they'll then say, well, Adam and Eve, ah, Adamic creatures or whatever, but God still created. This is what they're doing now, and here is a prominent New Testament scholar that many of you recognize. Sorry, I mentioned names. If they're in print, they're public, so therefore I'm going to... I have all of these quotes, John. So, the Bible says what it means. It, it means what it says. It's to be understood plainly, normally. Uh, God doesn't play games, and the ICBI men were men of integrity that didn't play interpretive games with God's Word. So, inerrancy, specifically the Bible, is without error in what it affirms. This is an outgrowth of inspiration, correct? That, that the Bible is the Word of God, meaning God is the ultimate source of Scripture, right? Coming through human authors, using those authors' unique backgrounds and vocabulary to convey His Word. Right down to the letters. God does not lie, he cannot err, so his word will not err. And if it, the word errs, then God didn't write it. That's right. And so I remember a professor of mine saying once, he, he was talking with faculty at his school who were all after him for affirming inerrancy, and he wrote up on the board in the room that they were in, the Bible, comma, the word of God, comma, errs. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Is that what you're saying to me? He was saying to his colleagues, and they're saying yes. Well, they're and trying. And then he, then he crossed out the Bible. He said, well, the Bible and the Word of God, those are in opposition. They're really they're re really equivalent. We can cross out the Bible and just put the Word of God heirs. Would you still agree that to, to his nine colleagues? And they all said yes. And he said, really, the words of a person are an expression of the person. And so he crossed out the Word of and just said, this is your issue. Though you believe God errs and I do not. And that is the, it ultimately goes back to the issue of inspiration. Is the source of scripture, the ultimate source of scripture, God, who can use human language, the language that he created in such a way to convey his mind through human authors using their vocabulary, their backgrounds to do it perfectly. Exactly. And what they're doing is playing interpretive games. They want to find as many places as I was told in my years at Dallas Seminary that they can. Look, liberal critical scholars have all the prestige. Uh, Society of Biblical Literature was long before ETS. The liberals control who's called a scholar. So if you want to have prestige and scholarship, you have to play their game. But these evangelicals know they can't play the full game, otherwise they'd lose their jobs. So what they do is they do this interpretive mind game of allegorizing so that they can be with the more liberal guys, find places they can agree, and still give some nod to what Scripture says. That's what's going on. It's a hermeneutical game. So let me ask you, when it goes to this, this ICBI statement, um, some of the pushback that I, I can imagine is, well, the statement itself is not inerrant, so, so why not change it? What what would be the response to my to, to response somebody like is that, that uh, they have no permission to change it. It's been done in the past. It's over. It's a historical statement of the seventies and eighties. But let me go to this too. Look, everybody, this is not the first time that all of this has happened. If anybody has ever looked at the fundamentals done by R. E. Torrey, there is an article by Dyson Haig, in which he tells the very same thing that liberal critical scholarship in his day was destroying scripture. And he gave the reasons why even, uh, den uh, mainline denominations fell. Do you know why they fell, he said? And I want everybody to go to the fundamentals, chapter one, Dyson Haig, he'll tell you why, here is why. In the 19th century, England was sending its men for the pastors of churches to Germany. Germany radicalized. You know, you remember in 1517, you had the great reformers, Luther, Calvin, 
and they in they put forth grammatico historical plain normal inerrancy over the years germany radicalized but in radicalizing germany had all the prestige so if you want your men to be prestigious england sent their men to germany and then the Ger uh, the germans radicalized the british scholarship now in America and among evangelical, well, I'll get myself into real trouble now. We're sending our men to radical British scholarship that were radicalized in the 19th century by the Brits, and they're bringing back this thinking. They're playing the critical evangel uh, critical uh, liberal critical scholarship game, and they're wanting to be accepted in the good old boys club. That's why this is going on, and woe betide me who will expose what's going on but my loyalty is to god's word amen and i appreciate the opportunity that redeemer has has given to sound forth the alarm and so there is no need they should make up their own this statement was done in the past see if they can come up with first i'd love to know what's wrong with it you notice they never said what's wrong with it. Did you see anything about them telling us? No, they just said it was inadequate oh, to okay. face well. the, current, the current things. But then you read the explanations of the article, the affirmations and denials, and all of those explanations fit all of the things that are being said it's inadequate about. So what they want to do is make this change because they themselves have changed, but the statement has is concreted in history and hasn't changed but they have changed it's not only concreted in history but it is established as the door into ets right and that's well they the adopted issue, right? it's a guide for them ets has one rule you believe in inerrancy but they never defined inerrancy <laughs> i think it was probably because everybody understood there are no errors in the bible but now they're using a backdoor called genre or uh interpretive hermeneutics to get critical or liberal critical scholarship ideas that they've adopted by the schools they've gone to to be accepted more. And so uh, I guess the, the next question is why, I guess it seems like why, why not just write a new one versus... I think they should. If they think that it's inadequate, it's inadequate please right. write a new one and let us look at it so that we may understand what you want to do. But the quotes, and I have so many quotes. I go places and I speak and I give these quotes. These quotes are alarming by evangelical critical scholarship. And if they want to change it so that these quotes now appear normative, the pulpit will be destroyed because seminaries will be training their men to disbelieve the Bible and then the pews will be empty if they are allowed to proceed with this. And that's not just a conspiracy theory alarmism. That's already happened in history 100 years ago. Uh, yes. Uh, the fundamentals was a wonderful testimony to the struggle that happened. All of these seminaries now that are loaded with evangelical critical scholarship, they all started as a result of the mainline denominations in the 20th century falling apart because of where they were sending their men to get trained. And now evangelicals have repeated the error of where they send their men, and now evangelicals have radicalized, and they're becoming more and more like their liberal critical counterparts. It's only a matter of degree, not of methodology or ideology. So now they want these changes so that they can kind of seal the deal that they are normative when they're not. The interesting thing historically is that 100 years ago, not only did this doctrine of Scripture begin to break down among Christians and develop into the fundamentalist modernist controversy, but it happened at the same time as there was an attack on culture by Marxism. 
is the same exact time a Marxist revolution taking place as we came into the 20th century at the same exact time as there is an attack on the scriptures. Today, we're having another Marxist revolution exactly. in our country. And, and lo and behold, there is another attack, continued attack by people within the church, both for socialism through the social justice movement and an attack on inerrancy and sufficiency and authority of scripture in the church. Now, you brought up an excellent point. Evangelicals are already, always 40 to 50 years behind the culture. So what's happened is in the turn of the 20th century, the mainline denominations, it took them 40 to 50 years to see the radicalization in Germany take fruit in their churches. So then the more Bible-believing people split, but evangelicals are always behind. Now that we're taking our men and sending them to some of the most radical places in Europe, they're picking this stuff, bringing it back. I always told my guys in seminary that they need to be very careful where they go. Some never listen. And uh, they're now bringing this back in the same way. And so it's always evangelicals catching up with the theological left the theological Joneses and bringing this in, and I fear for the people in the pews because you can sense in preachers how this will take the fire in the belly of a preacher out, and they will be preaching words that they no longer have a firm belief in. And I believe you talk not a conspiracy. Well, Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Paul says we need to take every thought captive. Paul says we need to take, uh, do not be captured by philosophy. I believe that even if it's human ineptness or foolishness, wanting to be a scholar instead of seeing the lordship of Jesus Christ, I still think that there's an enemy behind this. This, distru- this is no, may God help us at this time in our history, the church is threatening to be overwhelmed and destroyed by what you were talking about, critical race theory, all of these things that are stepping in. We are going to be destroyed if we allow our pulpits to have this kind of thing proclaimed by the professors in seminaries, in Bible colleges. It's, uh, it's alarming. It is alarming, and what's really alarming is that 100 years ago, there was a break-off movement called the fundamentalists who broke away from these things fought against it published wrote they did everything they could to protect their their institutions their seminaries their churches their schools uh in order to protect them from this and today it is few and far between now now i want to distinguish between the fundamentals of the faith and a fundamentalistic harsh culture yeah please do I want to make sure everybody understands when when I say fundamentalism, I know there's no fun in fundamentalism. There's mostly mentalism in the sense of their <laughs> culture. You had Christian schools that that did crazy things. I heard uh, heard about one school. You get into all sorts of legalistic rules. We're not talking about that. We're mm-hmm. talking about basic fundamental beliefs, just like the fundamentals, the virgin birth, the inerrancy of God's word. The fundamentalist culture I never liked, but no. belief in the fundamentals of the Bible Amen. is what we are emphasizing. So don't throw this idea of fundamentalist culture. I reject that. Mm-hmm. Jesus was loving and kind. He loved sinners. That's the way we want to be. But at the same Amen. time, we believe in the, the fundamentals of, of belief like the fundamentals before put yeah. forth in, in 1917. Yeah, it's the inerrancy of Scripture, yes. the virgin birth, the historicity of Jesus' miracles, yes. substitutionary death of yes. Jesus, the physical resurrection, yes. and his physical return. Yes, there are some Those things are Christians will always disagree upon, but when it comes to inerrancy and these fundamentals, we can unite across a wide spectrum of Christian churches to keep— you know, Jesus said something that haunts me. When the Son of Man returns, will he find belief? The That's faith. funny, that, that, that haunts me as well. That haunts me. So last thing, um, I was listening a couple about a month ago to a address that Francis Schaeffer gave in the early 80s called The Watershed of Evangelicalism. And he said that the, the watershed there in the Alps, there's one place where he was that if the rain fell on one side of the mountain, it would go to the Pacific and the other side, it would go to the Atlantic. Like, and it was the, it was the dividing line between truth and error. And he said the watershed issue 
was the inerrancy of Scripture. I will add to Francis Schaeffer, I'm not on his level, but we must understand that evangelical critical scholars will say, well, they believe in inerrancy. The question you must ask them is, what do you mean by that? And two, tell me about your hermeneutics, because they're using hermeneutical trickery, sleight of hand, to do what the assault on inerrancy tried to do before. Now, you know, it used to be, what's the difference between uh, uh, inerrancy and infallibility? There's well, no difference. But the liberals decided to say the Bible is infallible at the turn of the 20th century, but it still has errors. So now the word inerrancy, now they're wanting to, here's how they do this postmodernists. They want to change the definition of inerrancy from what is normative, no errors, to an aberration of it. So by using this trickery of hermeneutics and change of definition, they can sneak this under the door without being noticed. It's time to sound the alarm. Yeah, I had a professor in college who's now um, who's now gone, but he, I asked him once because he denied inerrancy. And I asked him because I know my the school that I went to, Vanguard University. I knew that the school had that as part of their doctrinal statement. I knew that as part of the Assemblies of God, which its first fundamental truth was the inerrancy of Scripture. I said, "How in the world then?" Like, and, and I was asking as a you know twenty twenty year old, brand new Christian. So uh, help me understand how you how you can sign the statement here, even though you don't believe it. And he goes, he took out a pen and he goes, "Oh, it's easy. I, it's just like this." Unfortunately, our schools, it starts in the secular areas of higher learning. It infiltrates our elite Christian schools, and then they train our pastors and our professors, and it goes into there. And unfortunately, we're seeing this very strong permeation and deterioration. Yeah, and that was Francis Schaeffer's point, is that why why make this such a big issue then? Why make it such a big issue now? He said there are two reasons. The first one is faithfulness to Scripture. The Scripture teaches its own inerrancy. Jesus himself said the words of Scripture come from God, Matthew 4.4. 4. I don't want to interrupt you, but I've read evangelicals say we can't take the testimony of Scripture of its inerrancy. We have to examine it externally of that. You can't take that testimony. That's what an evangel. I won't mention the name right now. I'll let it go. Well, we'll do subsequent shows, and we'll get into some <laughs> details here. He said the second issue is this. Without an inerrant Bible, the church will not be able to defend the truth against the assaults being leveled against it. And second, God's people will not have the source of strength and comfort that they need in the dark days ahead. And they say we're applying a hedge around Scripture. One uh, New Testament scholar, if you... Uh, 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 said, if you apply inerrancy, you're just making a hedge. If the Bible is inerrant, we can ask any question of the text. And if it's inerrant, it will survive. No, it depends on the kind of question you're asking and what the loaded presuppositions of those questions are. Absolutely. So why would we talk about this with you? It's for those reasons. We want to be faithful to the text of Scripture, and we want you to be as well. And second, we want to give you the tools that you need to defend this, to defend the truth against the assaults that are happening against it, number one, and number two, I guess, number three. We want to make sure that you have a solid anchor for your soul in the midst of the tumultuous times that we live in, and you will have that in Jesus, for sure, in the Jesus of the Bible the Bible's teachings about our Savior that you can trust because they're the Word of God and because they're the Word of God, they're without error. You can trust the Word of God that you have, that Bible that you have. In the dark days that are ahead, that seem to be ahead at least, we want to give you that anchor for your soul. And we want to create pastors. We want to create parishioners. We want to create we even, even guys that we send and plant who are rock solid on the issue of inerrancy. So we hope that was helpful. We'll come back with more shows on this issue. But again, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. <laughs>